Good to go. Good to go, Raina. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. I'll call to order the regular council meeting for Tuesday, May 20, at uh, due to technical issues, 7:05, uh, and the uh, we acknowledge that um, we're conducting our business today in the. Uh, unceded territory of the Silex Okanagan people. As a council, we recognize the importance of doing our best to build respectful relationships that contribute to the stewarding of the land and waters in the community with integrity and consideration for future generations. So with that, we adopt the agenda. Councillor Scarrow, Councillor McKenzie, those in favor? Opposed, motion carries, thank you. And the adoption of the minutes of the public hearing um, of uh, July 6th, 2021, be adopted. Councillor uh, Campbell and Councillor McKenzie. Those in favor? Opposed, motion carries. And the regular council minutes of July 6th. Councillor Ireland and Councillor McKenzie, those in favor? No errors or omissions, thank you. Opposed? None opposed. Um, <clears throat> the uh, Regional District uh, Board Report is, uh, you, has circulated minimal there. Uh, Council, the um, announcement as there are uh, no council meetings July 21st to August 23rd and um, the uh, um, municipality is still open but uh, we uh, won't be having those council meetings and the <laughs> Um, no delegation, no bylaw. Public comment. Anybody here that uh, wishes to address council on any issue of concern? Uh, do come forward. Um, microphone, your name. Uh, you have to turn the microphone on, if you will. I think I got it. Is that it? Perfect. Uh, Nick Koza, uh in support of a bylaw adopted by Lake Country concerning wildlife. Your which bylaw? Pardon? Vector. What bylaw? The Armstrong bylaw that I forwarded to Councillor Jeremy and McKenzie. Oh. Oh, okay. you guys gave it a name? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I didn't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can. Uh, there's no conflicts here. <laughs> Anyway, it uh, it comes up later, I think. Uh, yes. Yeah. As a notice of motion. So I'd be um, curious, obviously, your support, but if you could uh, expand on that slightly. Just right by, now. Just by <laughs> giving us a little little Cole's note version. Um, where I support this is the CO service does not have enough time to be dealing with. Um, patrolling for garbages, bird feeders, and so on and so forth. Um, even this past Saturday, a bear was posted on the community one page, and it's in a garbage can, the garbage everywhere. Um, that bear is pretty much going to be euthanized. So this is where I'm coming from. Mm -hmm. With We're losing too many bears just due to conflict that can be resolved with simple fines, people putting no garbage. That's good, good, thank you. All right, anybody else wish to address council? Uh, hearing none, second, third time of asking? Nobody, all right, then we go on to the, um, 
development for liquor licensing. I'll ask the planner to do that. Good evening. Great, good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Tamara Cameron. I'm the planner here, the District of Lake Country. Um, this is liquor license application R2021-004 for 158 Highway 97 North. The property is within the mixed use commercial future land use designation of the OCP and the C1 zone, Town Center Commercial. And this liquor license application is for a manufacturer's license for Lake Country Brewing Company with lounge and special event area endorsements. And I wanted to let Mayor and Council know that two letters were received from neighboring property owners in opposition to this proposal. And the applicant, Mr. Jason McCarthy, is available this evening should Council have any questions for him. So the property fronts Highway 97 within the town centre. And as you can see from the ortho photo, there is an existing commercial building on the property with five commercial retail units. And the neighborhood primarily consists of commercial uses to the north, south and east and agricultural properties to the west. And there is one residential property with two residential units located 10 meters to the north of the subject property. As a quick reminder for Council, this is a referral for the liquor um, from the Liquor and Cannabis Regulation Branch and the lounge and special event area endorsements are subject to local government consideration and comment. Section 71 of the Liquor and Cannabis Regulation states that the local government must consider the following, the location of the establishment and the per person capacity and hours of liquor service of the establishment. Additionally, the local government must comment on the following, the impact of noise on the community in the immediate vicinity of the establishment, the impact on the community if the application is approved, the views of residents and a description of the method used to gather views, and the local government's recommendations, including whether the application should be approved and the reasons on which they are based. And I did want to note that the options in the council report were formulated per the LCRB's um, specific requirements. So this proposal is for um, Lake Country Brewing Company um, for a manufacturer's license for a brewery with lounge and special event area endorsements that apply to the entire floor area of Unit 4, including an outdoor patio. The pro proposed person capacity is 105 people. That includes 97 patrons and 8 staff. And the proposed hours of operation for liquor sales is 9 a.m. to 11 p.m. seven days a week. A food truck is proposed to be on site during opening hours to meet the LCRB's requirements to make food and non-alcoholic beverages available to the public. And this is the proposed site plan and it shows the commercial property um, to the north, which is on the right hand side in the site plan um, and all the parking spaces that are available and um, the existing business in unit four, um, which you'll see in a later photo in this presentation already has an outdoor patio. And because I thought it might come up, um, the parking requirements for the C1 zone are two spaces per 100 square meters of gross floor area. Therefore, even though some of the spaces will be taken up by the outdoor patio, the commercial building still has adequate parking per the zoning bylaw. The impact of noise on the community is one of the criteria that the LCRB is asking the district to consider. And it is staff's opinion that the impact of noise is likely to be minimal as the location is primarily surrounded by commercial uses and orchards. It is possible it could impact the one residential property to the north. And then this photo was taken um, from the north side of the building looking towards that residential property that I just mentioned. I also wanted to make a correction um, to something that I put in the staff report. So in the report, I mentioned that the opening hours of Woody's Pub and 
um, Turtle Bay pub. I'm sorry, I mentioned those in comparison to the proposal from Lake Country Brewing Company. Um, but what I used is the um, hours of operation from their website rather than the approved hours um, in their liquor license applications, which are included in this table. So as you can see, um, Lake Country Brewing Company is proposing 9 a.m. to 11 p.m., seven days a week. Um, this is very similar to Woody's Pub and Turtle Bay Pub in terms of opening um, 9 a.m. and 10 a.m., um, but they are significantly um, later on some days, such as Fridays and Saturdays, they're approved to be open until 2 a.m. The impact on the community if the application is approved is likely to be generally positive in staff's opinion. It would contribute to tourism in Lake Country and add an additional social venue for residents in Lake Country's town center. However, it is possible it could cause congestion within the existing parking areas. As previously mentioned, two property owners submitted letters in opposition to the application and the map on the right shows um, where they um, own property. Um, the yellow stars show their properties. The letter included, I'm sorry, the letters included concerns regarding the impact to availability of parking and congestion caused by the 105 person capacity. It um, stated concerns regarding noise impacting the house at 9991 Okanagan Central Road East and the proximity and potential access um, that these patrons would have to the adjoining orchard property. And it also included concerns about hours of operation being too late and the fact that they will be open on Sundays. And then before I end this presentation, I, I would be happy to walk through the, this very long um, um, list of options, but I did want to note um, two mistakes. Um, so I mistakenly put um, July 8th as the date that the newspaper ad went out, but it was actually July 15th. Um, so you can see that um, corrected in red. And then the other correction I wanted to make is because I uh, mistakenly had the wrong hours of operation um, for Woody's and Turtle Bay Pub, the um, portion in red now is no longer um, as relevant. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, good. Any questions for uh, Councillor Scarrow? Thanks very much, Tamara. Actually, uh, some of my questions and I'd need Jason to answer for me. <laughs> we got a moment, Jason? <laughs> <laughs> you hear from the applicant, Councillor Reed. Did you want to talk to the planner? No, I just want to watch. I have to do my job. Okay. okay. Uh, we hear from the applicant. First, I'll kind of make my little speech, Jason, and then you Jason. can address them. I went, I went to all your business owners. Uh, today, and I spoke to all of them, with the exception of the bookstore fellow. He wasn't there. And uh, generally speaking, it's a kind of a positive reaction I got, with the exception of a couple. But through the conversations I had with each of the tenants, they did raise some issues that I'd like you to speak to. Of course, we've already talked about parking, and my big question is, on the drawing I just saw, You've got a lot of parking provided behind the building that I don't believe is possible at, at the way it is today. So what steps are you taking to make that parking available would be the first question. The second issue that a lot of the business owners had there were security after our security and what may or may not happen to their individual businesses um, as, as a result, eh? and understand that wasn't universal. That was just, you know, some, some of the people had this concern. The hours of operation were a topic for discussion and kind of split between the middle. I don't think anybody has real serious issues with that. Some of the uh, tenants there have issues with the fact that they can't park anywhere as employees or their employees can't park anywhere because of the lack of parking that exists, especially in the corridor between the Dairy Queen and, and your shops there. Eh? So uh, that was a worry. And of course, if you're having a restaurant that has a capacity of 98 people, um, they worry about whether or not that parking lot can even manage that at any given time. Uh, we worry uh, collectively about agriculture and what buffering you may have designed 
if you're going to reconfigure the rear of the building, like I think it is that you might be proposing. There was also smaller issues. One of them was the recycle and uh, garbage cans that don't exist there right now. Uh, they wonder where you're going to put them and how accessible they're going to be to their businesses. And then, of course, there's the big issue of the food truck. Uh, what I counted right now presently up there, Jason, was about 11 or 12 parking spots. There's room for more if you did it right uh, and remove some of the hat cross hatches there. Eh? But if you bring in a food truck, well, that's going to use up three of them. And if you put up a garbage can, that may use up another one. And, and, and I'm kind of wondering how it is you plan on doing that. I know the road down below is uh, highway frontage, so you can't really do anything with that. So you're left with what you have. Those are the lists of my concerns that I raised from all of your tenants, some of which I understand are quite related to you. <laughs> you're up. Uh... Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Um, I guess one of my mentors once said, if blah will work, don't use blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So that being said, I think there's a number of issues that were identified in your questions, some of which are uh, uh, legitimate and some are outside of our control or outside of the control of the application. So I just wanted to start with uh, clarifying uh, one comment that the planner make made, which was there were two letters of opposition from adjacent landowners. Um, just to clarify, there was one comment from an adjacent landowner, which was the, the owner of the orchard. Uh, I believe the address is 9991 uh, Okotogan Centre Road. And the second uh, letter in opposition was not from a landowner, it was from one of my tenants, that tenant being Dairy Queen. Um, and uh, um, so I'm not sure quite what direction to go in that, um, but you know, I, I would like to address the, the, those comments or those uh, criticisms, if you want to call them that, in addition to your, your, uh, your concerns that you gathered from your, your work in, through the neighborhood today. Um, I think just to, uh, I'm, I'm wondering if Tamara can put up the site plan on the screen just to clarify the, your, the parking. The parking issue? Yeah. So um, within the, uh, this property is zone C1, Town Centre Commercial, and uh, the parking regulations on uh, section 16.3 of the District of Lake Country Zoning Bylaw um, has parking regulations identified and it says in the C1 Town Centre Commercial Zone, a maximum of 125% of required par par parking is permitted. Now, having spent some time in your chair many years ago, the purpose was that purpose for maximizing the amount of parking that's permitted on a site is to create densification of our town centre. So, the district's objective was to have less parking, not more. That being said, everybody, when they want a place to park, wants more, including my tenants. Um, and just for some members of the council, uh, I, I'm the owner of the properties, both proper, both of these properties, and manage uh, the tenancies that occupy those, uh, those the, the commercial building there. So parking is an issue, indeed. Um, when we uh, constructed the Dairy Queen building, and just for relevance, the the, um, the required parking is two stalls per hundred square meters. Um, the building, including the Dairy Queen and the adjacent building on the site at 10074, uh, totals approximately 6,200 square feet, or about 600, give or take 600 square meters, times two parking spots per hundred square meters is 12, and we can't exceed. 125% of 12 parking stalls. So 12 plus 20% gets us to about 16. You can count the site and there is actually more than 16 on that site. The adjacent property is approximately 9,200 9, 9, square feet or give or take just over 90 square meters. Again, parking by, by law requires two per 100 square meters, which nine times two is 18. 
and it cannot exceed 25% of 18. We have 42 parking spots on there, which is probably approximately 200% of the bylaw. My so question, my question is, how, how are you going to attain those? Yes. So we there they exist today. If you'd gone around the back of the building, those parking spots all exist. They're there. They exist today and have for 45 years approximately. You may not have ever been back there, but there's a lot of parking in the back of the building. Um, now, just to clarify the concerns about the number of, of uh, the actual use, the actual parking as a use. Parking as a use is dependent on the tenant mix that you have in the building. So obviously office users generally tend to use the building parking for eight in the morning or 8.30 until four or 4.30, perhaps five o'clock, even 5.30 in the afternoon. So the density, most of those users there are all office or professional services users. Their office hours generally tend to be between about 8.30 or nine in the morning until about 4.30 or five in the afternoon. If you were to drive down by there tonight, as I did on my way, there were three, three cars in the parking lot. We have, again, 42 stalls on the site, south site. And I can tell you that all three of those cars were Dairy Clean employees that were parked on the south site. And there, there were some customers, but not a lot on in, parked in front of the Dairy Queen. It's a ghost town up there after five o'clock or 5.30 in the afternoon. So most of the users of this facility, the proposed facility that we're talking about tonight for the liquor license, will happen after four o'clock in the afternoon until probably eight or 8.30 at night. So there will be more than adequate parking, functional parking, and the parking significantly exceeds the bylaw. It's not actually permitted. We could not re replicate this building today with this number of parking spots as per the District of Lake Country bylaws. So we can't, we couldn't build it today and have that much parking based on the bylaw. We need a variance. So the parking, um, you know, it has been challenging from time to time. Um, that again, these are two separate properties, two separate sites. They happen to be owned by the same landlord, but uh, there is no issue on the southern site. There is an issue on the northern site, primarily because a lot of our um, our tenants have want to park at their front door. Uh, and they they are less concerned about where their customers park. Um, but about uh, five, about six months after the Dairy Clean opened, which was uh, six and a half years ago, approximately, we uh, had entered into an agreement for off-site parking, which we have had off-site parking for the Dairy Queen site, essentially since it was open for more than five years, at least. Um, I can tell you for certain that at least for the last two and a half years, not one single person parks in our off-site parking. Not one, because they all want to park at their front door. Uh, so the concerns of the existing tenants though I don't want to dismiss them, they are, they are, they have been addressed, perhaps not as conveniently as some of those tenants may prefer. We have an excessive amount of parking for this type of operation based on the hours uh, of relative activity within the business. Um, yeah, you know, security. I, I, I don't have. Uh, I, I don't have an answer for security. Although I, I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that that's an issue within the referral. At least I didn't see it on the list of questions for local government. Um, but um, my, my opinion of security is the more activity you have on a site, the, the, the less risk, or you reduce your risk of, of uh, security issues. Um, and. Uh, Again, going back to the official community plan, I think part of the objectives of the district is to densify and create mixed uses and multiple uses so that we don't create ghost towns at night. Um, and the more people we have around, the higher the probability of, uh, of having less problems, less, at least transient issues. Um, I, and, I, I agree, there's many benefits. I'm just expressing to you the concerns. Yep. And the ones that you haven't touched yet are the food truck and uh, the buffering for agriculture. Yeah. Um, so if you had gone to the back of the building today, um, you would observe that the retaining wall, which has been in place for well, almost 50 years, um, is about uh, 15 feet high, approximately. It's a 15 foot concrete wall to the top of the bottom of the, of the neighbor's orchard. Uh, on top of that, there is fencing. 
Um, and um, um, there is no, no way to create any physical buffering uh, other than the 15 foot wall. Um, and uh, I kind of wish you had gone up there because you probably would have perhaps a different view of the, the issue. Um, I will, uh, I will be honest. I, I, and I'm not sure if there's any of the neighbors, the immediate neighbors, um, basically in the top corner of that drawing, the, there's a duplex there. And, and I, uh, was expecting to hear comments about the, um, comments about uh, no noise concerns that they may have, uh, relative to their locate, their, their proximity to the, to the proposed location. Um, but I certainly wasn't expecting to hear a concern about noise from an orchardist. Um, and uh, having received the letter today, um, I, I, I talked to the actual orchardist, the, the, the operator of the property, because I've communicated with him a number of times over the years since, since we've shared a boundary. And um, uh, I said that we had received a, a letter or that the district had received a letter from from uh, the landowner, and I just wanted to confirm that the landowner lives in Williams Lake. Um, it is not the land. This this um, person that sent the, the letter doesn't live in Lake Country, doesn't live on the site, um, lives quite a distance away. And I asked him quickly, "Are you concerned about noise or or anything?" And he he said, "No, <laughs> I'm concerned about that." Uh, so. In terms of trespass, which could be considered another issue, um, I think that trespass occurs no matter how good your neighbors are necessarily. And uh, I don't have a specific uh, answer to address any issues about tr about people trespassing, except to say that if people are trespassing, I, I, they're, I'm going to guess that they're not likely coming from from Lake Country Brewing. There is likely to come off the sidewalk or the street or the road or any other place in the community as they are from, from this establishment. Appreciate your answers, Jason. Thanks for being here. Okay. Anybody else? Questions for applicant? Councillor Reed. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thanks to Mayor for your presentation. And thank you, Mr. McCarthy, for being here. Um, I just wanted to touch on, I didn't hear an answer to Councillor Scarrow's question about the food truck as to where it would be located. Yeah, thank because you. Because that's going to take additional parking yeah. spaces. Yeah, fair enough. Um, the, if I could back up just a little bit, indeed, it will take a parking spot, potentially. Um, yeah. They're, they're not bigger than a truck, but, but just where is it going to be located? I can't answer. I can't answer that. It would be. Uh, it would obviously be in the front of the building, right? Likely. So, um, having been to a number of the give or take twenty-five or so breweries that are located in Kelowna, um, this is a very common function and feature of these types of operations. It's actually quite, quite uh, cool. It's kind of fun. Um, because they are offer a, a variety, uh, different days of the week have different vent food vendors. Um, some of them literally are not much bigger than this table. Okay, I, th that's an exaggeration, but they would be smaller than this table. Some certainly are bigger. They're larger, larger vehicles. Um, but uh, in general, they're they're not going to occupy more than a single space. And again, if you were to drive by up there right now, there's probably about 65 empty parking spots up there right now, 60 anyway. So there is an abundance of parking on that site. So, sorry, thank you. I, you asked me the food truck, my apologies, Councillor Reed. No, sorry, um, you reminded me of it. So don't worry, I'm, uh, yeah. Um, so I'm just, you mentioned a couple of times that you were referring to the license application and kind of like taking us back to that. So I'm just going to also follow that instruction um, and just looking at a couple of the areas which have not got answers. Okay. So um, you, there was the outside patio and one of the requirements are um, from the licensing board application is how will you monitor and control the patron exit and exit through the patio area? And I didn't see a response to that. And then my other question, which is why I asked the question about where the food truck would be located, is that obviously one of the requirements is that alcohol is not carried through an unlicensed area. So where that food truck is located, 
um, impacts that requirement and how that will be monitored. So I just wondered, there weren't answers in here, so I just wondered how would you manage both of those aspects? You, you can't carry your beer when you go to pick up your food. No. The, so how are you? How so? How there's no information on that. So how that will be monitored? Will you have staff out in that area so monitoring pay, pay So the liquor control and cannabis branch, whatever they're called, have specific specific physical requirements to create separation between the licensed space and the non-licensed space. Right. And those uh, those requirements include a physical barrier. They're they're actual fencing or okay. or other ways of of keeping people from walking outside of the right. area with with liquor okay with alcohol okay so the, it just wasn't addressed in your application yeah. the the requirements that were required to be ticked were left blank so that's why i'm asking the so question. um councillor the 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 requirements of the of the regulation are about I'm going to say 50 pages long. Right. They're significant. And uh, some of them are physical, some of them are operational, some of them there are a number of requirements. Um, this uh, this part of the process is I is I believe to get collect for the for the licensing branch to collect information about the impact on the community as it relates to noise, traffic, mm -hmm. th those things. And so so um, my concern is again where the food truck is located, there will be patrons are they crossing into the lower half of that southern parking lot? So when you've got the capacity that you have of 97 patrons coming and going, I'm just worried about from the safety side of things, where the food truck is proposed to be located. Is it going to be near the Dairy Queen? So do the Dairy Queen uh, visitors need to be concerned about people crossing from the brew pub to the food truck? I just, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, so so that's not in the application, but I can tell you that from an operational perspective, right. it would make the most sense to me that it would be parked immediately adja adjacent to the to, to the uh, to, to the access to the to the um, the main entrance. Okay, so it would kind of impinge on the parking spots in front of the businesses to the to the left and right of that property, Correct. and because you're the landlord that's your prerogative to do that. So there, those patrons would find another parking spot further away. Yes. Pres presumably. Okay. Presumably right. they yeah. would, yeah. Okay. Um, and my final question would be um, on the hours. Um, I, you know, I appreciate Tamara's clarification there on what we license and what Woody's are doing. I mean, I would be looking to certainly match the opening hours that are in existence for Woody's. Um, I do love the idea of a brew pub. I do have reservations as to whether this is the right location um, in terms of accessing and exiting the site onto Berry Road and onto the highway um, with that volume of traffic that you're you're proposing. Um, and I suppose I, I again the nine o'clock opening time. Uh, I it seems early in comparison with some of the other areas in the building and is likely to I don't know whether that's likely to cause the conflict that you were that we were discussing earlier in terms of the office hours being used at predominant between 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. and then the opening hours of this business being 9 a.m. Um, you see it seems to be tailor-made to have a conflict at that kind of arrival time so that the patrons of the other buildings or the employees of the other buildings are kind of immediately in conflict with people arriving to the um, the, the brew pub. Um, so having those hours offset by an hour would kind of seem to mitigate some of that potential for conflict. So um, I would certainly be more in favour of a 10 a.m. opening um, to, to mitigate that from, from a, the whole community point of view. Thank you, Councillor. Just to clarify, the the hours that are indicated in the licence are not the oper necessarily the operating hours. So it is unlikely that this operation will be open from 9 in the morning until 11 o'clock at night. It's unlikely. Most that I'm aware of, uh, at least during the week, are open open anytime between three and four in the afternoon, and are usually open till nine or ten o'clock at night. So the license hours are as a requirement of BC. I liquor and cannabis. thank you, Mr. Mayor. I <laughs> confused their long-winded name now, um, and the fact that. Um, I don't want to have to come back and stand before you and go through all this process every time we have 
a change of our operating hours. But I can tell you that it is highly unlikely that we will open for business with 107 people in the facility at nine in the morning. That being said, part of this industry is a bit about what I'll call hands-on uh, business, and there are what I'll call brew days. Most of the facilities in Kelowna brew on Mondays, typically. Some brew more frequently than that, but Mondays. And one of the things that I think is really cool about the industry is they permit some of them, some of the operations actually permit people like me to go in and watch them brew beer. And almost invariably, at the time that they're brewing beer, they're bottling, they're canning and bottling and doing other things. And they will take some of the beer and say, what does that taste like? In order to do that, we need to have a license. And it's also the reason that the entire facility is licensed for the lounge. The lounge doesn't include the physical brewery operation, but if you want to permit someone to happen to have a beer in their hand in the manufacturing facility, that facility must be fully licensed. And so it would be really nice, perhaps if council decided to come for a tour one morning that we were brewing beer at about nine or 9.30, if you happen to show up and you said, oh, that looks interesting. It's a very unique color and perhaps flavor. And what would that taste like? We wouldn't want to be breaking our licensing uh, restrictions by having to wait until three or four o'clock to allow you to to do that. So um, our li the licensing permits us to be open during certain hours, but operationally it's highly unlikely that those hours will be um, actually that the operation, the business will not be, it's unlikely the business will be operating during those hours. All right, thank you. Anybody else? Councilor Gamble. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, I just wanted to ask a couple of questions. Um, so the one issue that um, I didn't really hear much of an answer for was the access onto Barry Road. Um, I know that you can get certainly out of the facility and in one, you know, if you're going um, on the west side of Highway 97, you can get in easily. Um, I'm just wondering about what your plan is. Um, I'm just thinking, you know, if, you know, closing time, if it, you've got a busy night and you've got a lot of patrons there um, and they're all going to be heading up Barry Road, you know, I know if it's closing time, it may not be as busy as we think, but, um, you know, it is a concern. It was raised by one of the people writing the letters. Yes. Or with the lawyer who wrote the letter, I think, on behalf of Dairy Queen. Um, and, and uh, you know, we know how busy it is with Dairy Queen. I mean, we're very lucky we got the advanced screen. That's been very helpful. But now we're going to look at a lot more traffic and there's no traffic impact study. And I, I'm going to ask Mr. Salmon to comment on this after you're finished. Yes. Yeah, so um, Mr. Salmon is probably more qualified to comment on, but you're the on traffic, you're uh, traffic impact than I am. <laughs> but uh, so uh, just to clarify, the access for 10058 Highway 97 is a fully um, full width highway intersection with a right in and right out, no left turn permitted at uh, at the south end of the site. Okay, so that's yes, which I'm aware of that. Yeah. Yes. Um, the dairy the Dairy Queen uh, access on Berry Road. I say Dairy Queen, it's not Dairy Queen's access, but the access to the site that contains the Dairy Queen um, also is uh, is constrained um, intentionally. That was designed uh, on purpose to slow traffic, mm -hmm. uh, to slow um, people that are accessing through through the Dairy Queen site. I, again, I would identify or suggest that the engineer is much more qualified to talk about traffic design and impact than I am. But yeah. certainly my, uh, going back to my Dairy Clean application days, um, there was a full traffic impact study done, at, but the focus of the traffic impact study was on the drive-through, not on the balance of the bill, uh, balance of the units yeah. in the facility. And, um, you know, all, all I can say is I, 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 the Dairy Queen, the Dairy Queen traffic between 6 and 7 p.m. at the at the drive-thru is challenging. Um, it's an operational challenge and um, I will be challenging back to the operators to resolve that problem or to reduce the problem if possible. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. but I do I do acknowledge that well, that uh, that access on Barry Road is physically constrained, but it is physically constrained on our site. Not we had no influence on Barry Road, although I did pay for that advanced light left turn off the highway. Um, the the actual on site uh, parking lot design is intentional to slow and designed to slow traffic. But the in, is the intent to use that as one of the main exits from your building? Well, I'm uh, probably um, yes. I mean, is that the intention? Um, it's hard to tell people they can't turn turn there, but yes, will they use it? I'm sure they will. Yes. So it that it is an issue, definitely. I mean, you know, there are pluses in my. I mean, obviously, having the business in the community would be an asset. I can see that. Um, you know, but I mean that that is. Yeah, we're, I, I would love to see some way to sort of mitigate that impact. Uh, that's the one issue to me that was a, a bit of a challenge in my Perhaps mind. the district could put a ter left turn light or le left turn intersection there at uh, Barry Road. <laughs> well, uh, no, I, I'm, I'm kidding, Councillor. I'm <laughs> just kidding. Um, no, I did before. Um, I'm going to ask Matthew to come up. Um, uh, the uh, question I also had was about, about the tables. You talked about the lounge part, and I, we don't really see inside the building so much what is your plan inside how big an area are you proposing for the lounge inside. area inside there's a picture and i probably didn't couldn't see it i couldn't open mine for the longest time i'm going to admit councillor i haven't probably looked at it for two and a half months oh, so really? so uh, I, I don't know the actual square footage it's probably okay. about i would say about half washrooms are about a quarter the manufacturing is about a quarter based on my recollection of the layout yeah. and that will likely change uh, again just to clarify the licensing process through the province yeah. is quite long and arduous and so as we move through that there will be changes to the design uh the layout the inter yeah. interior lay layout of the facility to meet all of their multiple pages of requirements and our our objective was to get the application in and it's generally current form to address the concerns that the community is asked to answer to, which is sound hours of operation. I can't recall whatever that list was that that your planning staff provided to you. OK, so so I'm also wondering about food. You're not obviously planning at this point to serve food inside the area. It's going to be brought in from the food truck that time. Brought in from the food truck or elsewhere. So we would encourage you to bring in your own food if you choose to. I see, I see. Alternatively, there are uh, delivery options, if I could use that. Um, the focus of the brewery is we certainly will allow food to be brought in from elsewhere and encourage people to do that. Um, I don't know how many of members of council have been to a, a brewery uh, in Kelowna, but it it really is, a, it's a different kind of experience. Mm -hmm. It is. Um, you will see people that literally bring their food in and play cards or video games or have their kids there, bring in bar bakery, bring in Dairy Queen. It's it's a really, it's a very cool experience that's not limited to only only buying product that's produced there in the facility. Yeah. It's much more. Being in one of yeah, those ones, it's much, the ones where they produce food. Yeah, it's much more, them. much more. Uh, there, are, there are a lot more options to that. Yeah. The food truck solution is to meet the uh, regulation requirements. The regulation requirements require that we have access to food during certain yeah. times, and that is the that is the purpose of the food truck solution is to meet those technical requirements by. Okay, thanks. Liquor licensing. Okay. Yeah. So the only person mm -hmm. I need to speak to is Mr. Salmon at this point. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. No more questions. Anybody else? <laughs> Matthew is going to be Oh. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Three, three of worship. Could they just get clarification as to the question, please? <laughs> Sorry, but I thought you might be a good person to ask uh, just about the access uh, onto Barry Road. And I know sometimes we do ask for transit uh, you know, impact studies. Is that required in this case? <coughs> Different property. So, so from my understanding, the you know the application in front of council right now for the liquor, yeah. rest, um, I'd have to refer back to um, Tamara as to whether 
well, that's a, uh, a requirement of this application um, and also the subsequent development processes as well. But from an, from an engineering aspect, um, I don't believe that there will be a requirement for a tra traffic impact assessment because um, it unlikely it's unlikely to trigger any of the subdivision and development servicing requirements. Uh, it will be subject to the, uh, the requirements of uh, the, um, the sanitary servicing bylaw, uh, especially when it comes to the waste product from from the operation. That, that's an issue that have to be resolved. Um, but that's the the only servicing aspect that um, is kind of on the radar right now. Um, one aspect we could look at is the um, the access permit and to see whether there's any substantial change in the access permit that was issued. Um, and if and if so, that that may uh, trigger some tr some further traffic analysis. Mm -hmm. Um, but again, that will be subsequent s stages of the process once once the uh, the application's been seen. Okay, uh, Renan, <clears throat> you had a, your hand up. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Our Director of Planning and Development would like to speak. Um, Easton, can you put a video yeah. on the screen? Jamie, do you, can you hear me? Can you turn your camera on? Oh, there we go. There he is. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of council, just joining you from upstairs. Um, with respect to issues like a traffic impact assessment or a traffic impact study, those would typically be done at the time of land use decision when the uh, when the zoning is granted to a property. So um, that would typically not be a requirement of that level of assessment at a uh, liquor license referral stage. Um, in this regard, it would be more for the uh, qualitative comments around that from council and the community which would be sought through this referral process, but not a uh, thorough reassessment of the traffic of the site, uh, which would be done at the time of, should this property be zoned as it currently is? So in some regards, the, the land use decision here has been has been made. It's more about the uh, the operational components of the, uh, of the decision. Thank you. And that is indeed what we're dealing with is whether we, See that. Uh, uh, Councillor Kozub, did you have a comment? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Jason McCarthy, it's good to see you again. It's been many, many years. Uh, for those that are not aware, uh, Jason was the one that got me involved in politics when I sat on the Community Development Commission board with him back in 2000. And then I took my sojourn to Alberta. And now that I'm back, I'm back in politics. But, anyways, besides, besides the point, when I first read this, I was really excited for it. I always tout buy local, shop local, support local, and nothing is more about that than this project. It's a local family, uh, and it's uh, not just a generic, you know, rubber stamped Boston pizza type thing. It's its own Lake Country Brewing, which gives its own distinct brand and flavor, which is something that, you know, we can tout to the community and to the world that, you know, this isn't just another generic establishment. Um, I did have apprehensions about the food truck and stuff that I know I'm probably not supposed to say it, but uh, I would uh, hope that maybe the food truck can get incorporated into the uh, patio, but that's a se separate subject that I can't talk about. And I know that I always cry about parking and the, the lack of parking here. I think there is more than enough parking and even that little bottom piece that just shows it as a blank spot, the highway access area could also as well be a uh, overflow parking if that were ever to be deemed uh, worthy. But uh, beyond that, I, I give this my full support and I actually want to move this. I want to be the person that moves this motion, please. You're moving uh, option or A, the liquor license. No, option A, thank okay. you. Thank you. Seconder, also Second. Councillor McKenzie. Any further discussion? Councillor Arla? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, I, uh, I've had all my questions answered. Thank you, Jason. Um, uh, I actually didn't know originally that th that parking existed behind until that drawing came forward <laughs> earlier. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. uh, you know, when I first saw it, I thought, well, where are they going to park? And then I see the back. So, um, yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, we've seen a number of iterations of businesses in this location, and now we've got a chance to have a, uh, you know, a Lake Country business in this location. I think it's important that uh, something happened there. You know, we cleared the way a few years ago to have Lake Country Brewing yeah. or some sort of brew pub in the uh, in the community. And as we all know, there's not a lot of options in terms of commercial space for that. Uh, there's not a lot of land, you know, if you were going to build. And that's another that's a whole other story. And, and yeah, the lot's a little awkward, but 
you know, it's uh, we've got people that are willing to give it a shot to to try to run a business here that will benefit our community. So I'm I'm supportive of it. Okay. Any further discussion? Um, Raina, you had a yeah. I was that your thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, seeing you, you had a phone call. Yeah. Any phone? Any call, Elaine? No phone calls, but anybody in the audience wish to speak with regard to this referral? Second time of asking. Third time of asking. Okay, hearing none. One more comment. Just seeing all my fellow councillors have said their uh, piece, so I'll just uh, I will uh, say that I do support this as well. I've been asking for a brewery in the area for a while, so mm -hmm. uh, just figured I'd give my support. Thank you. Those in favour? Oh, motion carries. Great. Thank you, and thank the applicant and. <clears throat> Everybody goes home sober. There we go. Early hours. <laughs> yep. Next one up. You see, there are more options with that one than any other. All right, uh, the next application is DVP 2021-004 for 13614 Cars Landing Road. This property is within the Rural Residential Future Land Use designation of the OCP and the RR2 and W1 zones. And this development variance permit application is to vary the dock shape to allow a U-shaped dock and to vary the dock materials to allow for steel piles. No letters were received from the public regarding this application. And the applicant, Ms. Brittany Jones, is available this evening should council have any questions for her. Okay. Just a reminder to council that this property is located adjacent to Okanagan Lake off of Cars Landing Road. And as you can see from the ortho photo, there is an existing L-shaped dock. And as a reminder, the application was first considered at the July 6, 2020, 2021 regular council meeting. Um, he, at that time, the dock design included a U-shaped dock with steel piles and two boat lifts, one on the north side and one on the south side of the dock. And council um, cited concerns about the length of the dock parallel to the shoreline when the boat lifts were taken into account and made the following resolution um, that this application be referred back to staff to work with the applicant to revise the dock design to reduce or eliminate the need for variances. After the meeting, uh, staff did discuss uh, council's resolution um, with the applicant, and the applicant decided to um, continue with the same dock design with the exception of they decided to remove one of the boat lifts on the north side. So this is um, their new proposal. So um, as council may remember, um, this is the same um, shape. Um, still using steel piles um, they're proposing, um, but as you can see, the north boat lift has now been removed. And um, just another reminder in support of the application, the applicant did provide a foreshore development report completed by a qualified environmental professional, and that report stated that there are no adverse residual effects to environmental values anticipated as a result of the project and the design complies with all other zoning bylaw requirements. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Councilor Gamber. I would make a motion, but I think it's a variance, isn't it? So yes, it is. Yeah, yeah I need to hear from you, Henry. Mm -hmm. Yep, questions for the planner? Uh, somewhere on your report, Tamara, when I read it, I read that uh, we actually have no authority to limit or deal with boat launch, boat lifts. It's through the bylaw and through our provisions. Um, I guess my scenario is the gentleman says he's only going to put one boat lift in and he puts into what happens. Uh, through um, your worship, mm -hmm. um, that is, is very possible. Um, they will have to deal with the province as well, but we and the zoning bylaw do not regulate the number of boat lifts. 
Um, so one of the discussions was the length parallel to the shoreline. Um, we do regulate that, doesn't necessarily include boat lifts, um, but but you, you're correct. Um, there is nothing in the bylaw that says that um, you could not have two boat lifts. So the proposal, with the exception of a promise to eliminate one boat lift, is exactly the same. And our width concerns of the width of the wharf itself remain basically the same, with the exception of only one boat on one end. And that's only a promise. Through the chair. Um, the one thing I will note is that through the development variance permit, we do attach the site plan um, to, to the permit itself. So the permit actually will say um, that um, it needs to be substantially in accordance with the site plan as attached, and the site plan will only show one boat lift. Thank you for your answers. Thank you. Councillor Reid. Councillor Starr read my mind mm -hmm. on this one. So, um, <laughs> so, so where, I mean, I appreciate the owner coming, the applicant coming back with this amendment, um, but how, how can we, again, I, I'm still struggling with how we would enforce that should the owner decide to put another boat lift back onto the north side. Um, and I would say, as an aside, that's something that we need to address in the zoning bylaw when we look at doc, uh, the doc review that we're planning. So um, I think we specifically also need to look at boat lifts and in particular piled boat lifts. But, but where where do we stand on that? You know, as a district, if the owner decides to put a boat lift on the north side after we've approved this. Uh, but we're dealing with what's being proposed, not what if so. Where there's, what, what are you suggesting? If they build it and then put a boat lift on the north side at a later date, what re remedy do does the district have to enforce what we're seeing in Same. front of us? Same as any other, let's say they're in <clears throat> contravention of what they're permitted. We'll hear from Raina. Through your worship, thank you. Um, as far as bylaw enforcement of the zoning bylaw, we could potentially enforce work without a DP. I'm not entirely sure. It's it's unlikely that this is something we would consider through bylaw enforcement. I would recommend the likely would be a review of the zoning bylaw, like Councillor Reed was suggesting. Okay. No building permit. Yeah. Uh, can I ask a question for Director McEwen in terms of the time frame for looking at the DOC bylaw part of the zoning bylaw? It, uh, if it's okay. Yeah, we yeah. can hear. Can't yeah, see. We, we do have a, um, I believe, a, a session to speak with Council in the near future. Um, with respect to uh, this very issue, um, getting the the amendment, you know, we'd like to have more of a strategy session type discussion with council around the the broader issue because changing uh, one component of docs opens up uh, a number of other issues, uh, you know, and uh, so we want to have a comprehensive discussion with council around that. And uh, within the next couple of months, we can be bringing forward something. And in fact, I already have uh, um, some initial considerations for council uh, drafted. OK, yeah, thank you. Plus, province has some say in what happens. They uh, <clears throat> talk about how many docks you can have and how many lifts you can have and whether you can have a dock and a rail or whatever. But Related also to water depth, but what we're saying what we have been, I believe we've been saying is that we don't want a dock on the north side, and I don't believe there's anything in the provincial regulations that would stop that happening. A lift, yeah, yeah sorry, a lift, sorry, boat lift on the, on the north side. And I don't think there's anything in the provincial regulations as they're set out that pre prevent them putting a dock lift on the north side. 
So I'm torn. Well, Councillor Aaron. Yeah, maybe a question for the applicant. Uh, <clears throat> um, did they consider having the U like most other U-shaped docks, <clears throat> where the boat actually fits in to the uh, to to the nine meters? And then, you know, if they put a boat lift on the outside, well, they put a boat lift on the outside that accommodates two boats. But um, here, uh, well, we sent this back, so we've got a boat lift that's being removed from the outside, and, and I'm pretty sure that the dock company that builds this would not put that boat lift in. Um, but the owner could go to somebody else and put it in, and I don't think that there's anything that we actually could do about it. Um, so, you know, was there no consideration for building a U-shaped dock in the standard U-shaped thing? I mean, th this is <clears throat> what we're doing, doing on this dock is is providing a large platform out on the lake and attaching a boat to the either side of it. But the U is not providing mooring as such. So maybe the applicant can. Uh, is the applicant available? Uh, yeah. You want to speak to council? And your name, please, for the. Yeah. Uh, my name is Brittany Jones from Shoreline Pal Driving. Uh, um, the reason we it, it's an existing dock, and for us to put out a U the other way, we'd have to replace multiple sections of the concrete that's currently there. Um, so what we're kind of doing is more of a cost effective approach by adding an additional extension to the one side than to accommodate the boat lift. Mm -hmm. um, the reason that we decided to choose the south side other than the north side was because there's a little bit greater water depths on the south side of the dock. Um, as you can see from like an overview that I was just looking into the paper documents, but that was the reason for choosing that. And then also just because we chose the U this way due to just not having to replace everything. Thank you. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And this is um, for anybody else in wish to address this variance from the gallery. Second time of asking. Third time of asking. Harry Nell, I need a motion. Option A. I'll motion option A. Move. Councilor McKenzie, second. I'll second. This is. Uh, so the guy can use his dog. Those in favor? Oh, yeah, discussion, question? Just to put, I'm sorry, the applicant, you're gonna hate me for this, but just to put an alternative out there, is it, could this wait until we've done the dock, the work on the dock rezoning that would then allow this to come forward with potentially restrictions on, or, or not restrictions, but with boat lifts included in the specification of a dock that would then allow this to go forward possibly without variance but it would mean waiting until that process has been completed so i'm sorry but it would just then sit it within the framework of the bylaw but i just wanted to put that out there okay thank you um I, uh, director uh, jamie who wanted to speak? I'll get to Ben. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Your Worship. And I can certainly um, understand uh, that that sentiment. With this proposal having been submitted under the existing bylaw, it would be considered uh, lawfully non-conforming, um, and would be have to be considered under the uh, the bylaws of the time of application. Uh, so, whereas we don't currently regulate the uh, the number of boat lifts, for example. Um, that would be uh, something that probably would not be applicable to uh, to this application, even with the uh, uh, changed zoning bylaw. Okay, thank you, Councillor Gamble. Um, I I would like to support this because I think the applicant has made a big effort mm -hmm. to change this, and I'm going to trust that the owner is uh, going to be good for his word. Um, I would like to see the. Um, design drawings um, attached to the submission 
uh, when it goes forward, mm -hmm. as our planner has indicated uh, she will do. Um, so I, I'm prepared to support it. I, I think that the applicant has uh, made an effort here to to try to address the issues that council raised. Okay. Thank you. Those in favor? Opposed? None opposed? Motion carried. Oh, you're opposed? opposed. Council of Chicago opposed. Okay, motion carries. Thank you. Um, and you're up again. No. You guys, they, they have reptilian blood. Yeah. Reptilian. Sweater here. The air skin. The reptile. All right. Sorry, Tamara. There. Okay, so the next file is DP 2021-001C for the property at 10386 Newmean Road. This property is within the high density residential future land use designation of the OCP and the RR3 zone. This development permit application is to allow an existing fabric covered structure within the hillside and greenhouse gas reduction and resource conservation development permit areas. And I wanted to let Council know that the applicant is available this evening should Council have any questions for him. So you can see from this map, the property is within Winfield and is also within the town center area. The property has an existing house and an existing accessory building in addition to the fabric covered structure, which is the subject of this application this evening. The property slopes up steeply from Nguyen Road and then flattens out where the structure is located before sloping up again towards the top of the property. And there are existing mature deciduous trees as well as a fence that provides some screening of the structure from the road and the residential property to the south. Bit of background, the um, structure was built without a development permit or building permit around 2017. The building department became aware of this structure um, around June 2018 and sent a letter to the property owners requesting that they apply for the required permits. This is the site plan that the applicant submitted with his application um, showing that uh, the tent is 114 square meters in size and it does meet um, all the zoning bylaw requirements in terms of setback and height um, site coverage. The structure is used for um, vehicle storage, I believe um, vehicle repair as well, and it is located near the front of the property at the top of the hill and is partially visible um, from across uh, Highway 97. This is what it looks like. Another image, this is taken from uh, the from Nguyen Road at the bottom of the property, so you can see um, that there are um, there is a fence and um, some existing vegetation screening it. This is taken from a little bit further down um, Nguyen Road, again showing that there is existing um, trees that do provide some screening of this structure. Mm -hmm. Compliment. And then oh, sorry. Oh, <laughs> one, one more slide yeah. um, and this photo shows um, that the applicant has planted four additional trees um, to um, screen the structure. Overall, the hillside and greenhouse gas reduction and resource conservation development permit areas do not contemplate um, fabric covered structures. Um, therefore, many of the guidelines don't apply very well in this situation. Of the guidelines that do apply, the proposal meets slightly less than half. Thank you very much. Councillor Gamble, question? Um, <clears throat> well, Mr. Mayor, I'm prepared to move this. I think this is an excellent way of creating storage with having very little impact on the environment. Um, it's, it's a fabric covered building. I think it's amazing. Okay. Uh, you know, so I, I would move support for that uh, if there's a seconder. Councillor Arnold second. And yeah, I'll second it. Also, I, I think the applicant, you know, he's he's been sensitive to the community. It's, you know, he's he's screened it. He's adding more screening for it. So, um, yeah, I second it and support it. Councillor uh, Scarrow. 
Oh, uh, go along with that. <laughs> I definitely agree. I, I appreciate the fact these plants and trees. I do have concern about the fact that the fabric buildings sometimes are susceptible to the elements and uh, may, may be damaged. Um, outside of the topic that we're talking about today, which I support, eh? uh, I, I think that the gentleman or the owner of the uh, building is doing work on vehicles and stuff like that. And so I just kind of extend an opportunity to that owner to uh, apply for a temporary use permit to run a small business out of his home. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I, uh, Councillor Reed, you have a question? Just a super quick one. Um, my question would be, have the newly planted trees been irrigated? So just checking on their chances of survival. Mm -hmm. But it's no to his rainwater recycling used, so. Yeah, yeah. no, I, that was just my question as to whether they're uh, irrigated. So thanks, thank you, sir, for providing that information. You know, from one thing I look. <laughs> Thank you. Those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. I won't raise the question. Um, oh, we're done. Mm, nuisance amendment. Is that the one? No. Community uh, engagement. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, here before you uh, regarding three applications for the Community Engagement Grant. Um, these are three new ones. There has been three previous ones uh, falling under the same intent, working with community groups to undertake works mostly on uh, municipal land um, to support both the community group and the public. Uh, one is from the Tennis Association, uh, which supports a storage side shed so they can keep uh, equipment down at uh, Woodsdale. The other one is a request through the Pickleball Association at Benchlands for a set of bleachers and a gate uh, into the pickleball court because there is no actual entrance into there it has to go in through either the tennis court or the uh, multi-sport court. Third one is from Rotary in support of the annex at the museum in Okanagan Center to make that a three season uh, cafe rather than just the typical summer season that they have. Uh, a couple opportunity and benefits there. Uh, I, th I believe all of them benefit the community in general. Uh, that one there allows um, to the museum. Uh, the council has asked, you know, all of our community groups that ask for that re request funding uh, to diversify their revenue streams. And I think this also meets that intent that they're allowed uh, to have their operator of the cafe have a longer season. So it's a double benefit, I'd say there. So those are the three applications. Um, and there's multiple options that uh, we separated out uh, together individually or none. So I, I leave it at that for council contemplation and questions. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I would uh, I would move that we support option A. I think that all of these applications are uh, in the spirit of what we're trying to do for the community, they all not only benefit the groups that are doing them, but they benefit the community as a whole. And, uh, you know, they're not restricting anything to any single individual group. So it's actually improving all of our facilities. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I uh, motion option A. Option A, Councillor McKenzie. You I'll uh, second, but uh, just a couple comments. Um, you have in there that there's a uh, um six grant applications uh on the bottom there mm -hmm. so is that six counting these three yes six, there's been six total so three previously so oh. oyama cars line and recreation association and walk so mackey road trail and coral beach north so we have seven thousand left no this is the completion of the the money that yeah we the have. seven thousand was previously committed to those three projects this is eight thousand for the total so of we're all used up for, for 2021 Okay, just want to clarify that. I wasn't 100% yes. sure. Thanks. Um, Councillor Gamble, you had a comment or a question? No. Uh, Councillor Reed? 
Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Matt. I just also want to, I think it's important to acknowledge the contributions that have been made in terms of district staff time towards these projects as well. Um, so on top of the 8,000 in terms of capital, um, it looks like we've also got a, approximately 7,200 in terms of staff time. And I know that's happened with some of the other projects that have come okay. forward, particularly in the Cars Landing area. So um, I just wanted to say thank you to staff for fitting these in within the operational budget, I'm assuming, and with all the other priorities that you have. I'd say this is a, a, an opportunity cost because it is a fixed cost in terms of wages. It's right. how we've appropriated the time rather than an operational sort of budget component. It's a fixed cost of, of the time that we felt that these projects were worthwhile mm -hmm. putting the opportunity cost to that rather than an additional operational cost. And but I you think, have to support these projects. Yeah, obviously. yeah. And I think it's important to also note the uh, significant contribution from the Rotary. Very much so. The, the, the total project cost is, is 25,000 and they're bringing 20,000 to the table. So whoever was involved in the fundraising, raising, thank you very much for doing that. One, one more comment on that. Um, in terms of Rotary, I would like to give a significant shout out to them just in general, the amount of work that they've done through volunteer in kind and actual cash contribution. If anybody attended the Lobster Fest, we'll call it, um, they've that group of people has put a significant effort into this community for a number of years, whether that's event driven, capital driven, or just volunteerism in general. So I think we can all learn from that group of people uh, what community spirit is. So I greatly appreciate um, their work and I know Mayor and Council does and always says. Yes, yeah, certainly do. Um, Councilor McKenzie. Yeah, I just want to acknowledge that too. I spent a couple of um, uh, their calls with the Rotary Group and that's definitely a very passionate group. So I just, you know, I'll echo those comments because I think that is a very good community organization. So, and um, just one last little comment on your time there. Appreciate your extra time after your team got knocked out early in the playoffs this spring. <laughs> I will, I, will, uh, I will bite my tongue at this point because I can't really defend anything about it. I just have to take my lumps. <laughs> yes. I, I, I could comment about the Buffalo Sabres, but I will not. I do have one more comment, though. I think uh, more just for, for council. Um, the value proposition of this community engagement grant has been leveraged in the multitudes on here. So there's been contributions from each of these groups on each of these projects, the community engagement grant, but the outcomes have been significant. So we're looking on the $15,000, the return on investment, if we're looking at that way, has been astronomical for the community. So thank you to council, I'd say on behalf of the community and staff that having that uh, purview to provide these funds to, you know, on the engagement, even with the community, I think it's been beneficial there to show that partnership. Right, thank you. Um, Councilor Scarra. Matt just said it. Uh, I'm very excited about the community engagement grant fund that we created last year. It's the only opportunity or one of the better opportunities we've had to put dollars directly in the hands of those that do the volunteer work around this community. And one of the considerations I'd like is to maybe expand the 15,000 to a little bit of a larger number next year and maybe we can even gain more benefit from it. I definitely agree with uh, Director Bader that uh, the community involvement portion of this has value, great value, and uh, we're making this $15,000 into a million, uh, in my opinion. So I definitely support this. And I'm looking forward to talking about the bridge project next. I have Councillor Arla next. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I'd just like to echo the, the comments about Rotary. Uh, I've had quite a bit to do with them and always volunteered to help them through their other events and things and uh, what they've given this community is, is really incredible over the years. I mean, from uh, from the food bank onwards, um, there's, there's so many projects that they've contributed to and run and come up with incredible, like the lobster fest. I mean, that was an out of the box idea for COVID that, uh, you know, they couldn't, they didn't have any of their traditional fundraising methods and they came up with this idea of a drive through lobster thing and that was fantastic. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Kudos so, to all those people because our community is better for them. Lobsters. And uh, you might ask uh, Councillor uh, McKenzie over there, where Jack Eichel's going? <laughs> yeah. um, all right. Those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Mm, thank you, Mayor and Council. Grant and aid application. <clears throat> 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That one's mine. Um, so different grant application under a different pot of money. So this is our grant and aid uh, pot where we have $7,000 in there. And I do believe uh, Jackie just joined us um, on the team's meeting. So she's available and she also, I believe, invited uh, the member of the church where the proposed fridge will be located. Um, so they have a couple of slides to show council. Uh, but just to so let council know that they are requesting uh, $2,500 from the grant and aid fund. There is not $2,500 left in the grant and aid fund as it stands right now. There is $2,169 uh, remaining in that fund. So if council did want to issue the full 25, there would be 2,000 available and then the remainder would have to uh, come out of potentially council contingency or you can look at alternate amounts. Um, so there's those options presented for council and um, if Jackie is available, I believe that she had some slides to show council. See if we can get her over on the uh, I had a question. I don't know if you can answer in the report that uh, said they weren't they were working with the United Church, but they weren't sure if they had an agreement with the United Church. And I, I tried to get hold of somebody in the church council, but Nobody's answering. Their well, phone I can maybe oh, just maybe, uh, yeah. comment on that because I did meet with the, the minister, Joan uh, Kessler, mm -hmm. today, and we did talk about this project quite a bit. And definitely the proposal is uh, to have it on the church property. It, it won't be able to go to council until they're meeting in August. Uh, mm -hmm. That's when they meet. Um, and, you know, if we do make the motion, it could be subject to that approval, mm -hmm. okay. you know. Because uh, I'm from yeah. what I've talked to in the congregation, uh, that is the church I do attend. I don't know if that puts me in conflict, but I don't think no. so. <laughs> um, what I've heard is there is support for this type of thing. Okay. I believe that's correct. And I believe uh, Jackie, the applicant, did invite one of the members of the church to speak to it. But at the time of the application, uh, the application had said that it was under review. So yeah. uh, so that may have changed uh, since that time. But oh, it looks like we do have Jackie up on the screen. Good. Hi, Jackie. If those uh, if you would like to go ahead, council can can hear and see you. Sure. Great. Can you hear me? Sort of. Oh, should I talk? Maybe I should talk a little louder. Yeah. Can you hear me better now? Yes. Yep, that's yeah. good. Oh, good. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for having me today. Um, yeah, I do have Joan on the call, too. I don't know if she she was having some troubles connecting on um, on Teams, so I don't know if she's able to talk or not. Um, but I can I can speak on her behalf. So I we, I have been speaking with her, and um, she's part of the church, as Penny had mentioned, um, and they're just looking at securing the location and getting approval with their council members. Um, but that it does seem pretty positive right now to to go ahead with that. Okay. Uh, any uh, questions for Jackie from council? Councilors. Um, Hey Jackie, hey. Uh, we've been told by our staff that we're just a little tad short on cash. Uh, would a, a number like 1500 or 2000 go a long way? Um, sorry, I couldn't hear it very well. I'm sorry, I'll speak louder. <laughs> uh, we're a little short on cash being told by our staff uh, within the um, grant and aid budget. And we wouldn't have enough cash to give you $2,500, but we may have enough to give you somewhere between fifteen and 2000 What yeah. would that do to your project? Um, you know, we're, we'd be happy with anything that you're willing to provide. Um, our budget right now is an estimate, and we, we don't know exactly what that's going to look like. We've been talking to the Kelowna uh, Community Fridge as well to get an idea as to what we can expect, but their initiative is also pretty new. Um, so yeah, we're we're happy with anything that um, you're willing to provide. Yep, thank you. Yeah. Chris Carroll, I move two thousand dollars support. Okay. Councillor Gamble, second. Any further discussion? Councillor Reed. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I don't know. Do we still have Jackie on the line, or did we leave? I'm here. 
Oh, fantastic, Jackie. Um, my question is more kind of practical and um, forgive me, this is my lack of knowledge about community food fridges. Is the fridge going to be within the United Church or is it outside the United Church? It's outside the United Church. It'll be on the west facing side. Um, that's what they're proposing right now for approval. And so it can be accessed 24 seven by those who are willing to stock it and those who um, might need food from it. OK, thank you. And how will you monitor the quality of that food? Is that because obviously it's outside in the heat? Yes. Um, so from a food safety point of view, given some of these food might be going to young families, how is that managed? Is it? It's in the fridge. Well, I mean, things go off in a fridge. So, yes. so um, who, is it a process of monitoring it each day and checking for the viability of the food or, or, or what's the situation? Yes, yeah, so it's actually um, a fridge and also a dry goods structure. That's what we're proposing. That's what Kelowna has done. That's what the Calgary location has also done. Um, and we, what they do is they have some volunteers that have signed up to take shifts throughout the day. And that's what we're proposing is that we'll have um, volunteers to cover off at least a couple shifts a day just to check for um, food that, you know, if, if anything doesn't look right or um, has gone bad or anything like that, you know, pick up garbage, keep things tidy. Super. Um, and my, my understanding from the budget is that the donation from council would be used to pro provide food? Um, Potentially, yes. Um, we're hoping to get the building materials and the fridge itself donated. Um, if that doesn't happen, then some of the money might have to go towards that. Um, and also some of the um, potential repairs that might be required later on down the line. Um, but some of it might be for food. Yes, we have been told from the Kelowna fridge that sometimes there's just not enough. I mean, it fluctuates depending on the season as well. Um, probably need a little bit more. It would probably need a little bit more assistance in, say, the the winter when there's less fresh produce available. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Thank you for the information and thanks for taking this on as an initiative and uh, supporting yeah. the community. Thank you. Welcome. Good. Motion. Those in favor? That was Councillor Scarrow and Councillor Gamma. Yeah. Uh, opposed? None opposed. Good. Thank you, Jackie, and thanks for taking that on. Thank you. Next one. Nuisance banner. Yeah, amendment to, to be read a first time, second and third time. I have a bit of a presentation for you, but I will keep it short. Um. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So on April 6th, Council passed a resolution uh, directing staff to amend the nuisance bylaw to specifically address nuisance lighting. Uh, our current nuisance bylaw includes a definition of nuisance, but it does not actually include that the word lighting. So under the community charter, we can address and we can impose regulations specifically for illumination or any matter liable to disturb the quiet, peace, rest, and enjoyment, comfort, or convenience of individuals or the public. So staff undertook a review of other communities' bylaws to determine uh, how they were enforcing their nuisance lighting and used those as a proposed amendment to our own nuisance bylaw. So this is the proposed amendment of adding it to the nuisance odor section. So nuisance odor and nuisance lighting 7.1 remains the same and we add 7.2 where a person being the owner or occupier of property shall not allow or permit light from an exterior source to be placed in to be placed or lit in such a way that the light fixture casts light directly onto a window or other opening of a residential structure located across a street or adjacent to the real property, um, or that the light unreasonably disturbs the peace, rest, enjoyment, comfort, or convenience of the owner of the occupier of the neighboring real property, and this does not apply to exterior light from street lights, or lights on playing fields, or school playgrounds. So that's the proposed amendment to the nuisance lighting bylaw so that will help us enforce specific lighting nuisances so in addition to that uh, i'll just add that um, 
this will not allow us to tell anyone when we go to enforce nuisance lighting, we can enforce that it's a nuisance and that it's in, impeding someone's peace and enjoyment, but we cannot tell people how to fix those lights. We can't tell them it's too bright. We can't tell them they're too big. We can't tell them to point them in another direction. We can just tell them that they're a nuisance and that that nuisance must stop how they choose to do that. We have no direction. So anything specific to those types of lightings, types of lumens, specific types of lightings for zones, commercial zones, residential zones, that's a much larger discussion um, and more likely applicable in the zoning bylaw. Um, so that's where we've just stuck to nuisance. And so on top of that, in order to help the bylaw officers and the public understand what a nuisance actually is. Um, I did a significant amount of legal reading, mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot, um, to come up with this list. Um, so this is all based on the case law and there's a lot of case law on nuisance and it's so subjective. It is so subjective on what is a nuisance. It is what one person thinks it is, is another person's right. Um, so, so this is the criteria uh, that I narrowed down and thought this, these criteria would help not only our bylaw officers, and I ran these by Albertine to make sure, did these, would this help you out in the field? If you had this checklist, could you look at this and would it help you make that determination of being reasonable or unreasonable? And would it help you explain it to the residents? Um, so this is what we came up with, um, again, based on, on lots of case law. And it does a lot of the time come down to the bylaws officer's discretion. They must have that discretion to determine if it is a nuisance. But I do believe this will help give them some uh, direction. And then, of course, our amendments so that we can ticket for that are included in the recommendation. Okay. Um, Councillor Ireland had a question. Yeah, no, I don't have a question. I'm going to move option A. Okay. Um, Councillor Gamble, you had another? Well, I'll second option A, but I, I want to compliment uh, our uh, corporate director because I think she's done a very good job researching this and coming up with uh, some guidelines for our bylaw people. But she got all that exciting legal reading. Yeah. <laughs> it was a little exciting. Yeah. No, I'm not going to lie. Councillor Councillor Coza. I enjoyed it. <laughs> Yes, I just wanted to speak to this as well too, that uh, when I first went to Jasper in 03 uh, and they had the uh, dark light policy, I thought it was a little bit ridiculous as a, you know, when you get a phone call in the middle of the night because your lab light is left on and you have to get in your vehicle and drive down and shut off the lab light at the at the uh, sewage plant. It seemed kind of ridiculous, but uh, not only a nuisance to, I wanted to point I wanted to make is not only a nuisance uh, to uh, other humans, but as well a nuisance to animals. And uh, Councillor Ireland and I have had extensive talk about this, and he said that even the lights of uh, Big White Mountain uh, set uh, a flock of birds astray that landed in the wrong spot and stuff. So it's not only just for the humans. So I, I, I totally look forward to seeing this. And uh, Jasper, just in, in March 2021, Jasper just celebrated 10 years of having the largest uh, dark sky area in the world, not just in Canada, but in the world, which is pretty easy to do when you're a community of 3000 people in a massive national park. It's very easy to do, but but it, it's it's it, it is astonishing when you go into the forests of Jasper and look up much like when you go into the mountains up here and you look up and you can see every last star. It's just amazing. And uh, if we can do something about light pollution and light penetration, then that, that's all the better for for our night sky and especially for those that like to stare at the stars. Thank you. Right, thank you. And uh... I noticed in the report, and certainly we introduced a night sky bylaw uh, on development, but uh, the other ones you looked at said a lot of them said everything except street lights. We don't have, can't do anything about that, but I thought we could uh, uh, determine what type of street lights uh, and make we them. Do. Make That's them, correct, yeah. Right. That's through the Subdivision and Development Servicing Bylaw. Uh, so we monitor our own lights. This would be for any other lights that aren't, aren't ours. Our lights are governed by the Subdivision Bylaw. Ace Hardware. Okay. Ace Hardware would now fall under this bylaw mm -hmm. and we'll have a chat. All right. Those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. And, Thank you. Uh, One more for me. Right. Protective. 
Oh, proactive. Proactive by law enforcement. So this was uh, council discussed this at a strategy session and just following up on those right. priorities that uh, that council established, which I don't have up on the screen. That's from the last one. I uh, so we came up and we have the four here. So please feel free to change or amend these if you like. But now that I have my full time bylaw officer started yesterday, we'll get them up to speed, hopefully by the end of the week and we'll get out there and take on Airbnbs as number one. And then uh, we have our nuisance lighting and nuisance odor, illegal parking focused on areas that are of high public use. So that was our um, Oyama and Okanagan Center and high high traffic areas. And then encroachments into public right of way that affect public access, I should say, or the environment, I believe. So that's what I had taken from the strategy session. Mm -hmm. Councillor. Scarra moved and Councillor Reed second and a comment. Go ahead. Just me being pedantic, but do we need <laughs> pedantic? <laughs> no, it's very me though. Um, <laughs> um, with the illegal Airbnbs, do we need, should we amend it to say illegal short term rentals, brackets, yeah. Airbnb, i.e., Airbnbs, just yeah. to, I know they're on Kijiji and other places as well, but just to be. Short term vacation rentals, I that think is it. what we call them. Yeah. 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 Okay. Got it. Any, any further discussion? No, we have. I need, uh, Councillor have a Scarab, second. And Councillor uh, Reed second. Is it? Mm -hmm. Yep. Those in favor? So motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, nothing in camera, nothing in camera. Oh, um, Okanagan. Oh, subdivision servicing by the way. <laughs> yeah, no discussion. Moved and seconded. Those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. That's the um, end of the yeah, bylaws. Um, and uh, the Okanagan Basin Water Board report. Uh, we, I don't know if you have read it, but uh, at this past meeting, the, uh, we adopted uh, a uh, motion to give full voting power to the Okanagan uh, Nation Alliance representative at, at the Okanagan Basin Water Board, yeah. sort of in keeping with the uh, UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and um, it's going to come to the board as a request from the Okanagan Basin Water Board for ratification. Right? The Okanagan Basin Water Board is made up of the three regional districts in the Okanagan, and uh, North, uh, Central, and uh, uh, um, Boundary Simulcomine, uh, or Okanagan Simulcomine. So uh, this is not a formal request for this council to approve it. We'll get, we'll get that from the Okanagan Basin Water Board, but certainly we had uh, a very good presentation by the uh, Okanagan Nation Alliance, the uh, Tabastic, and uh, uh, with um, and remotely by the chief of the West Bank Band, uh, Chris Derrickson, and uh, they were pleased with our support, and I was sure that we would, uh, and in time, uh, support it. And so I thought I'd give you a heads up report that it will be coming to us as uh, uh, for discussion. And councillor item. We'll start with councillor Reed. I have um, three things. Um, first of all, um, it's a thank you to all of the fire personnel who have been out of our area attending 
and supporting colleagues in other areas such as Lytton. Um, in some cases, pulling, I think, virtually 24 hour shifts in response to uh, the emergencies there. Um, and thank you to the uh, fire department for coordinating that while still ensuring that um, our, our sort of our community is protected um, in all of our wards as well. So that took a bit of coordination. So I just want to say thank you to that. Um, this would be just a, a, I suppose, a general question. Um, I've had a couple of calls um, or discussions around the time frame for the development permit process. Um, I know traditionally pre-COVID we've been working on a three to six month time frame with a one month for building permit, but um, currently we're quoting um, 12 months to 18 months. Um, and it would just be a question to staff as we move into um, the budgeting process. We've been doing a lot of work with Director McEwen and uh, Corey Gain, our manager, to improve the process. Um, and we have an in IT infrastructure program that is looking at improving efficiencies. But I just wonder whether it would be possible for staff to come back to council when we reconvene or um, even beforehand, if it's possible to get an update on just um, is that a reasonable, is that a is that a correct time frame that we should people should be working to? Um, and if so, what support is needed to bring us back into our pre-COVID um, time frame? Because obviously some of this is impacted by COVID and others are by the busiest three years in development applications that I think the district has seen. So I would be interested in hearing thoughts on that. We'll ask the administrator. The so through your worship, I can confirm that those are the timelines right now. That is correct. Um, there's a few ways to address it, I suppose. Uh, certainly more staff can solve lots of things, except for the fact that it's not just more staff mm -hmm. in planning, it's more staff in engineering and then likely more staff in other areas because we just can't continue to support more staff in, without adding to other staff areas like HR or um, clerks or things like that. So there's definitely additional supports that would be needed. Uh, we could address that in a similar fashion to the way bylaw was addressed in a previous year. However, I don't know how much work we'd want to do with that unless council was prepared to bring forward, somebody was forward prepared to bring forward a notice of motion that we could do that much work, but certainly we could do an update after the break as to where we're at with the personnel issues and things like that. Um, there are lots of influencing factors though, and mm. that includes, you know, everything from um, the level of regulation that council wants or sending reports back multiple times certainly slows processes down. So which is important, obviously, to the process, but it definitely impacts the timing of how things get back in front of council. So there's lots of pieces to it, and it's not just one angle or one piece. It's not just process, and it's not just uh, staffing, and it's not just regulation, mm. and there's a whole bunch of parts to it. But we can come back and talk to council about that some more. I think it might be something that I know we talked about it early in the year about having possibly a strategy session with the planning team as well. Like very much like we did with the bylaw team to hear their thoughts and solution possible solutions, and so maybe we need more time on that in the in the next quarter. Um, and my final point um, was to say before we go to our summer break, thank you to all the district staff. Um, I think as we get out of the pandemic or we're heading out of the pandemic, um, everybody's looking forward and I just would like to take this moment to look back and say thank you to staff. Sorry, I get quite emotional on this. <laughs> thank you for, to staff for the last 18 months. You guys have really kept the district running um, against pretty tough odds. I mean, you, we recognise the impact that's had on family life, having to deal with maybe other family members having to self-isolate, having to homeschool school kids while still keeping the district running and being there for the community. So just as you think you're going to get a respite, then we get wildfire season. But I just want to say thank you very much. And I applaud all the efforts that everybody has made. It means a lot. Yeah. And we, uh, we missed the floods, but we haven't missed the fires. And um, certainly, and we've been trying to, um, and we recognize that there were difficulties in planning, but um, it's hard to get 
planners. Uh, uh, every uh, it's uh, difficult to, to recruit, and uh, so we are still running lean. But uh, certainly, staff has uh, has given great uh, effort to keep us uh, continuing to keep running and providing as best service as we can. And we're asking for people to give us. Um, not be too impatient when we get a little bit behind. Anyway, Councillor Gamble, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to uh, comment on the petition that Tim Tyler presented uh, to Council uh, about two weeks ago at the Council meeting, and that was regarding uh, safety issues on Pretty Road North in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and just appreciate that People did take the time to sign the petition in spite of all the problems with COVID and that, uh, that there are some concerned people out there and uh, look forward to hearing that discussion as we yeah. go through to that. Okay, thank you. Councillor McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just a quick comment on um, the time frame thing, just looking at the monthly building permit. Um, I see that the year to date we're at 191 permits versus 144 last year. So I think that's a little bit to do with it. We obviously have um, the value of it is a little higher last year, but I think that $9 million fire hall is part of that. And then 11 million in agricultural buildings, not quite sure where all those went, but I think that's part of it. So. Um, uh, yeah, I do want to acknowledge staff too. I think staff's done a good job, so um, I'll give uh, echo those comments. Um, one thing I do uh, want to um, comment on is uh, a shout out to our firefighters and our first responders. We've had a lot of fires and a lot of um, ones that are set not accidentally that have been doing on purpose. So. Um, mm -hmm. I've been in, uh, I don't know how you address that, but it seems to be becoming a bigger problem. Um, that and uh, the garbage in the bush thing. And so, uh, um, you know, big shout out to guys like the Kane Blake and stuff, because, um, you know, without those guys, that yeah. problem's a lot bigger. Clean, clean forest. For clean forest, but also catching guys on fires as well. So. Um, I don't know what we have to do there, but uh, definitely we need to step that one up. Um, one question I do have as well is with our sending guys away to fires. Um, so say somebody like Pete Whitfield I hear is gone away to a fire and he has to take um, holidays. So I'm just curious why some of our guys are doing that. And I'm curious what our, uh, how we approach that as a district. I, I realize that we, when we need help, it's great if we can get people and, you know, you don't really ask the um, the details of why we just appreciate the help. And I'm just curious if um, how that all works there when we loan people. So if I don't know if Steve's online, but our, our CAO would like to comment. Mm -hmm. Steve, are you there? Chief Windsor. Mm -hmm. Maybe not. All right, <laughs> Chief Windsor's not there, so I will do my best to answer that. Um, my understanding of the process is that it is a voluntary process. So our um, the province phone says we need some assistance. We look at our group and our what we've got here available for apparatus and staffing and decide whether or not we can spare uh, assistance. Recognizing, of course, that if we ever had our own emergency, other parts of the community, other parts of the province are asked the same thing. So we try where we can to support. So we have sent a truck. We ask for volunteers out of our volunteer fire group. Um, our staff as well are covered under that volunteer fire group. So all of them, including staff, are asked if they would like to attend. Um, staff take vacation if they do want to go. So they take vacation from the district and then go and they get paid separately through the province. So we bill for our apparatus and our staffing, and then the province pays us, and we pay the, the staffing and the apparatus costs out of that, so our fuel and things like that. Okay, no, thanks for that explanation. I just want to clarify that because uh, it seems to be a question that I've been asked a couple times lately, so. 
Yeah. Um, but uh, other than that, yes, um, I think uh, all is pretty good out in Oyama. Um, I haven't seen anything. It's getting a little busier now that people are figuring out that Wood Lake is safe to swim in again. <laughs> We can't keep um, sending that out and uh, having people show up in Okanagan Centre and Cars Landing instead of Wood Lake. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, all is good. And the only other thing that uh, kind of surprised me in Oyama that I just heard about today at the dog park was um, uh, down on Sawmill Road, at the end of it, there was those two buildings that were for sale for a long time right across the cannabis. And I hear we have a little rattlesnake issue out there. So and that's right across from the school. We got a little pond in between, but I've never seen a rattlesnake right in Oyama specifically, but now I've been hearing more of them. So I hope that uh, doesn't they don't make their way around that lake because uh, we might have a little issue with the kids. Him as a snake pit. Yeah. <laughs> really. <laughs> There's lots on that side. Uh, thank you. Uh, Councillor Ireland. Are we doing notice of motion, sir? Uh, we, have two of we have two of them. Yeah. Jeremy's was actually first. So why don't well, you go? And Nick's been hanging out there. <laughs> and Nick's been waiting for you all night, so I'm prepared to defer to Councillor Paul. Okay. You're up, Jeremy. Thank you. So, yes, I'd like to bring forward the uh, wildlife and vector bylaw. And once again, I'm going to revert back to Jasper and say that when I, when I went up to Jasper, I thought it was ridiculous that uh, if you had a dirty barbecue, you could get a fine for that. And I was just like, what? Are these people crazy? These hippies? Like, but now that we move forward along and seeing the, the problems we have with animals and human animal interaction and, and how the at the end of the day the animal is the one that ultimately pays the ultimate sacrifice to the humans so anything that we can do to uh, alleviate that Todd did read through it too and he had some points that he had sent out in an email I don't know if he wants to touch on that now but uh, you know some of the some of this bylaw might have to get tailored to our own specific needs seeing that we're a heavily agricultural area, it's kind of, Penny can't be going out and picking up all the pears in her orchard, but uh, some of the things that we can do to look at that. Mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Did you want me to comment on that one? I, I, they're telling me I should refer to staff, but I didn't know if you wanted to comment yeah. first before well, referring to staff. The, the, my big comments were just because we're uh, agricultural community versus Armstrong. We do have a lot of fruit around that. I know I got apple trees and I have deer coming into my yard like I did a couple of days ago and they pick off the apples. But um, it's uh, to clean up every couple of days might be asking a little much for a lot of these people that have a few trees on the ground there. So um, I just think we need to, to customize it to Lake Country and, and being being mindful of um, of what we are, so. Yep. Uh, Councillor Reid, I'll hear from you. Thank you. Um, I would echo those comments, and I, it's kind of implicit in the implementation, but I do also think what the report to Council needs to consider the practicalities of implementing this bylaw. How are we going to enforce it and what does that mean for the resourcing? Because I think there is definitely more education that can happen in the public, and that would come as part of this bylaw process um, in terms of getting that information out there and allowing people to to self-moderate, but also I think if we are putting a bylaw that has teeth and we want those that to be used, then I think we also need to seriously consider the resources and how that bylaw would actually be monitored and followed up with within the community. Um, mm -hmm. And I think given the discussions that this community that we've had about bylaw and the amount of pressure on there um, in terms of responding to what we ha currently have on the books, I think I would be expecting to see an increase in staffing potentially in order to add this on as another layer on top of that because without enforcement I don't think we're going to see the compliance and for, certainly at the beginning. Okay. Anybody else wish to comment? And I think um, the bylaw is, is like any other a certain amount of self-policing that if you at least have a bylaw that says 
this is what you should do with your garbage and uh, how you bear proof it or as best you can. Um, if we don't have a bylaw that says that, then um, we can't really, the neighbor can't talk to neighbors or whatever about getting rid of attractants. So, um, you know, bylaw is useful in that way. Difficult to enforce, but at least it's there to enforce if, if it comes to it. So uh, we can, uh, I would certainly support a motion to introduce some wildlife well, bylaw. Uh, you know, I, I think it's again. reasonable if, if it, uh, in certain instances, like for instance, uh, educating the public to um, mm. put their garbage out on the day of, of pickup. Mm -hmm. makes sense uh, and and it isn't just bears it's uh, raccoons mm -hmm. and Coyotes you know and you know uh, animals that <laughs> also can be a, a big nuisance I mean we never ever ever saw raccoons in this area when mm -hmm. I grew up here and now they're they you know you see them all the time people introduced them. yeah they're well cute, and cute there's pets. a lot more garbage out it's easily accessible um, but but I have to say it, to expect uh, an orchardist um, mm. to pick up uh, that that is ludicrous. It is ludicrous. Um, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And uh, many of the orchards are fenced. In any case, I mean, bears can climb fences if they're hungry. Yeah, they and if they're if they're that hungry, if they're that thirsty, you're going to get bears in there um, because you know that that is the one time you might get a bear in the orchard. Uh, when there's a drought, but that's about the only time I've ever heard of bears uh, coming in much of the orchards, except parts of Oyama where they they frequent and they've been known to frequent them for many, many years, you know. Um, but yeah, that I just have to say that that labor is the number one expense on a farm. And so to <laughs> to think you could add a huge new expense like that, um, no, I mean, you're not going to have that much food producing in that case. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Councillor Kozub, your motion. So I'll move my motion forward then. I'll second it. Okay. Which is? I'll move the motion forward that staff be directed to research and report back on implementing a wildlife and vector bylaw by Jeremy G. Kozub. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'll still okay. second it. Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. All in favor? All right. And uh, now, Councillor Ireland. Uh, yeah, it's staff be directed to provide well, option mate, for many mm -hmm. building mm -hmm. regulations by law. Mike. Sorry, Mike. 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 <laughs> you should just leave it on the whole time. <laughs> uh, yeah, now I've lost it. See you, Nick. <laughs> Hey, where are you going? <laughs> I know you're going. We're not done. Okay, Bill. Staff be directed to write <laughs> options for amending the building regulation bylaw to ensure step back retaining walls are required to include plantings and screenings. And we've talked about this several times. Arena, or uh, Jamie, uh, you're up. <laughs> Yeah, thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Uh, just to add a consideration for council on this one, uh, you may want to also, um, it might be uh, prudent to align a review of our zoning bylaw, which also deals with some landscape buffers and setbacks on, uh, on retaining wall regulations. And uh, we could do those two concurrently, so they speak to each other. That might be an appropriate uh, addition if you'd, if you'd like to consider that. Uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm perfectly fine with that. Um, Always add to staff. I spent work. the day in Wilden, and uh, I strongly recommend that the guys from Lakestone maybe take a drive through Wilden and <laughs> see what they've done in terms of uh, plantings and screenings, and and uh, quite an attractive neighborhood. Thank so, you. So I will uh, second that with the uh, addition, but from from uh, our director there. Okay, you got that, Rain. Very good. Those in favor. Those motion carries. Great. Councillor Scarrow. Well, of course, I share my thanks to the staff. And we're going away for a summer break. So I think this is an opportunity to share my thanks to my peers on council. We've put in a lot of work this year 
and long hours and 11 o'clock is getting more and more normal. So I appreciate each and every one of you and uh, thanks for doing the job that you do. All right. And with that, appreciate adjournment too. With that, with that we are adjourned. Yeah. yeah.